Welcome everyone to our new lesson with International DevOps Certification Academy where it's our biggest duty and pleasure to serve you on your own exciting DevOps journey as much as we can. So today we are going to discuss a very interesting subject. We are going to discuss about DevOps flow. So in a nutshell, so let me briefly introduce you what DevOps flow is. So if we basically um, resemble software engineering process to a manufacturing process, let's say from the you know initiation of the production activities until the shipment of the customer, let's say let's talk about this uh, iPhone for instance. So imagine first you design it, here are your sketches, and then you know the first iteration for the production of the first iteration, you take it to your production band and somewhere you know you build the frame, the metallic frame of this product, and then the next one, you know, the circuit comes and then the different you know connections comes around, and then you put you know let's say the speakers, the microphone, and then the glass, and then the cover, and then packaging and shipping. You know, if you resemble this process to the software engineering, you know, you start from the you know requirement analysis and then you know, the typical phases such as you know designing and then coding and then you know testing and you know the, the UAT testing and then deploying and then monitoring and then shipping and everything. So if we resemble the production to the software engineering, so basically they both have a flow. And what is critical for the software engineering is in most of our companies, so basically if the flow is broken at some place, we usually tend to ignore it and then obviously this has done very you know adverse consequences for our organizations. But in, in flow to be able to enable the ops flow, if something is broken in the development chain, so we basically have to give an alert to everyone. Guys, we have to stop now and we have to look at why this problem is happening. And then we need to address these issues before we continue you know, the development in the next stage. You know, if, if this product is broken at this moment, you know, maybe there has been an issue in my own step, so my team members can help me to identify where this problem is, or maybe this is the problem is one step before, or maybe 10 steps before or 20 steps before. So basically, why we have this step of flow is, you know, we have to see it, we have to flow, we have to see the progress, and then if there is any issue in the deployment pipeline in the flow, then we stop and then we address it. And therefore, to be able to set up all these, you know, processes and procedures in place, we first need to understand what flow is, the ops flow is, and so basically we come to today's lesson, uh, after having said that, we will discuss how we can enable our DevOps flow in our organizations and in our IT teams. So without further ado, let's uh, get started with today's uh, lesson. So to be able to <laughs> give uh, more space to discuss, let's uh, make myself a little bit uh, smaller. Okay, great. So as I said, today's subject is how should you enable your DevOps flow. So let's get started. In DevOps, Flow means end to end manufacturing chain of software from idea to running lines of codes in your production systems. You and your DevOps teams are in charge of building and sustaining a reliable, consistent and fast flow to meet and exceed your organizational goals and to outcompete other products and services in your particular market. So define so what you need to first do is you need to define a mission for your DevOps transformation. So this is very critical. You know, when you get started with your DevOps initiative and transformation, you need to announce so basically what your mission is because you need to you know answer the because you know, you need to tell people because we have to do this. And to be able to you know present your because you also need to present where you want to reach with your DevOps initiative and in a second I will tell you how you are going to do this. So after you have your DevOps team in place the next step is to define a mission. Only by having a common mission, your team will be equipped to correct the function. Without a mission, your team will never be able to prioritize the critical work and distinguish showstoppers from errands. The mission should be challenging and impressive, but it still needs to be achievable in a given time frame. A mission should be tailored for your DevOps team. It's based on organizational characteristics, challenges and objectives to serve internal and external clients interacting with your DevOps team. So some example mission statements to get your DevOps transformation started can be 75% reduction of average lead time from code checking to live production systems in three months, 
33% reduction of average lead time from request to live production systems in 6 months, 50% reduction of number of production incidents in 12 months. If you notice, you know, this example, you know, mission statements has, has uh, two things in common. They are basically quite measurable with metrics such as, you know, 75% reduction of average lead time or 33% reduction of average lead time or 50% reduction of number of production incidents. And then the second common characteristics of all these three, you know, example mission statements are they are basically time bugs, so they have to be finished either in 3 months, 6 months or 12 months or you can basically do it, let's say, 1 month goals or 2nd month goals and you can basically put all the milestones along the way, you know, you learn, you know, you improve, so maybe you miss one deadline but then you can basically catch up in your next iteration and so basically, as uh, we also discussed in previous le uh, lessons, you need to able to basically enable a transparent, you know, deployment pipeline and therefore whatever you do, you know, you may, you know, progress may be slower than you envisioned in the beginning, but also in uh, also for this fact, you need to be, you know, fully transparent and, you know, to, you need to, you know, sh share all these details together with your organization. Huh? And then the next step is, you know, what is value stream and who are involved in your value stream? So in order to improve your work, you need to know your value stream. A value stream in information technology systems is a sequence of activities required to design, build and operate a specific software product and service. Furthermore, a value stream defines human resources, know-how and utilities and materials which enable the value stream to flow. So in a complex organizational structure, no one is fully capable of identifying an end-to-end value stream. Therefore, it's important that all members of your DevOps team, stakeholders, providers, client representatives, if possible your clients themselves, should participate to identify your value stream. So how we are going to build our value stream? This is the next logical question, right? So then let's deep dive in this question. So build your value stream map to find out the improvement potentials. So a value, a value stream map enables you and your DevOps team to visualize how a typical work in your software development and delivery organization is performed. By building a value stream map, your goal is not to make a comprehensive documentation about each and every step to, to get your work done. Your goal is to gain sufficient insight about your typical workflow to identify where major inefficiencies, constraints, issues and waste of time and resources lie. When software development and operation engineers for the first time sit together and build a value stream map, it's usually the first time for an operations engineer to comprehend the negative effects of misconfigured database servers without table space on development teams. Similarly, <laughs> it's very funny. Similarly, it's the first time for a software development engineer to see the consequences of delivering software without built-in monitoring, availability, testability and configuration features. So here, uh, in a very you know, abstract sample of a DevOps value stream map, um, you know, which can be used for software engineering process. So here basically the request comes and average this takes this many hours, you know, let's say um, comma five point hours and then it needs to be approved somewhere and then how many hours it takes you know, the work is like takes one hour but you know the, the, the in the queue you spend like eight hours on and then refining signing of an analysis design and review and coding and testing and deploying etc the gray boxes you know tells you the, the the amount of time you should basically spend for this activity in your workflow and then the 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 hour in let's say in i prove you see one hour and then the hour you see in the white box basically represents the, the actual amount of time you or your team member should reserve in order to implement uh, this particular activity. So another things uh, which are very critical to, to basically improve your flow. So you basically emulate handoffs as much as you can and constraints and vested vests as much as you can. So some of the most significant but overlooked factors of efficiency are handoffs, vests and constraints. When an activity is handed off from, from one team to another, it requires signaling, requesting, scheduling, of course, prioritizing or deprioritizing from the time and resolving conflicts. When a work is passed 
from one team to another, each handoff will not only result in loss of information, but it also negatively impacts the overall lead time of your value stream. And to overcome these problems, there are your basically a few options. So here I'm going to present three of them. So you need to challenge the duration required for each handoff. For instance, according to above value stream mapping example, it takes 80 hours until a successfully tested code is picked up by development team. So it is here. Um, let me identify the exact location. So it's here. So basically, it takes 80 hours. So here in this code block. And um, why is so the, here the question you need to ask is why is this like that and can't we automate this process and of course so basically you know the answer we can and you need to eliminate the best caused by repetitive handoffs according to above value stream mapping example the test team hands off 65 percent of their features back to the development fixes for some defects need to be delivered up to three times until they are approved by testers couldn't we speed up these iterations by enabling better integration between development and testing uh, teams or team members? Couldn't we speed up these iterations by enabling better integration between development and testing? And high number of defects show that sh something does not optimally function for your development team. The reasons of these quality issues need to be identified and sorted out. You need to challenge and remove handoffs as much as you can. According to a list stream mapping example above, once the request is refined, it takes 320 hours until it's processed by sign of authority. Why do you need such a sign of authority in your organization in the first place? What is the value of this authority for your value stream? Has this authority got sufficient level of information and vision to give a good decision? Why doesn't the sign of authority become part of request refinement team so it knows far more better about what is being signed off and there will be one less time-consuming handoff which takes 320 hours. Unless you remove constraints and barriers which slow down your flow, you can't really accept much from DevOps. So DevOps expects you to ask such questions to break status quo. Not everyone in your organization will be of course happy to hear such questions but you are already prepared for this, you know, difficult uh, discussions. So here, so basically, this is, uh, you know, just, you know, to, to show you what, what I just uh, described. You know, here you see 25 to 65%, you know, the fake ratio found in testing team. You know, this iteration you know, between code and testing, you know, happens uh, three times, you know, each, you know, fix basically need to be tested again and then you know, again a bug is found and then one more iteration and one more iteration of this three iteration you know, takes obvious a lot of uh, time eh? and then basically the tester spends you know, 40 hours of actual work just to approve just to basically do the test and then you know gives time signs off for the feature but you know this flow this overall activity takes like you know 240 hours, which is basically uh, too much. And here you clearly see that from your value stream map, there is a problem going on, and it's your role to be able to address this issue and then you know, deliver a solution. This is what you what you have to do together with um, DevOps. And uh, make your flow visible to everyone. So this is this is uh, again one of the aspects that I mentioned before. You, not only you know the progress of your project, but also you are liable to make your you know um, flow visible to everyone together with DevOps. So in order to make sure that your work flows from left to right, in your organization accomplishes its goals, you need to have tools and mechanisms in place which make your flow visible. In information technology business, it's a matter of a mouse click to assign a work from one team to another in your value stream. However, Due to incomplete work, inconsistent dependencies and misunderstandings, it's part of your daily business that your work bounces from one team to another, so-called one step forward, two steps back, and it flows too slowly if it flows at all. Therefore, it's important to make sure that your flow is visible, not only for your team, but for everyone. DevOps relies on product backlog, sprint backlog, 
excuse me, sprint planning backlog and Kanban boards to visualize flows. These boards do not only involve works or let's say tasks which belong to your own DevOps team, but they should also make the entire flow visible from the idea conception of your products and services to operational maintenance and end of life. In this way, whenever a work doesn't flow, it will be quickly visible for everyone and it will be the joint responsibility to everyone to remove roadblocks and impediments to enable continuous and successful flow of your work. Isn't it great? So, let's see here is an example in you know, the DevOps Kanban board and you know, let's see this, you know, DevOps is basically has some, uh, the, the Kanban basically has some, you know, flows, some have some, you know, columns when you define a table, they are like, you know, they are in the backlog and then they are scheduled, you are working on it and ready for testing and, you know, testing is ongoing and done. And so basically you, you define these activities in overall, you know, the, the software engineering cycle, you, you do, you have a Kanban board for design, you have a Kanban board for development and you have a Kanban board for operational, you know, activities such as, you know, creating servers or installments or let's say, you know, the preparation of uh, various environments such as, you know, st staging environment or, you know, uh, enlarging your, your production systems or putting it to another uh, geography and everything, you know, these are all the activities that uh, you need to implement and for each of these activities it's best to have another separate um, board. And another thing which is very critical is you know you need to limit the bed size and work in progress to be able to fast you know to be able to progress fast and to be able to uh, you know sort out your issues as quick as you can. And the research concluded and Stanford University found that Multitasking is less productive than doing a single thing at a time. Very interesting. Thanks for the Stanford University, guys. The researchers also found that people who are regularly bombarded with several streams of electronic information cannot pay attention, recall information, or switch one job to another, as well as those who complete one task at a time. Watch out this. How, how, does, how does this mean for your DevOps team? What does this really mean for your DevOps team? It means that you need to reduce your work in progress and limit the batch size of your code deliveries. As an illustrative example, your team can have maximum six work in progress tasks in development to avoid continuous context switching and enable full focus on work at hand. Alternatively, you can estimate each task with a story point weighted by Fibonacci numbers. You know, Fibonacci numbers are these numbers, you know, who the, 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 the next number is, is the sum of the last two numbers and the consequence is like, you know, 0, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, uh, 13, 21, 34, etc. As an example, how I found out here, 8, so 8 is the sum of 3 and 5 and 13 is the sum of, you know, 5 and 8 and this is, this is, this is, this is one of the, you know, most frequently used way of, you know, estimating or identifying the story points in Agile and DevOps methodology. So let me let me continue. So alternatively, you can estimate each task with a story point weighted by Fibonacci numbers, and your DevOps team processes up to a certain total number of story points velocity in a given time frame, or we call this time frame sprint in Agile and DevOps methodology. So besides increasing quality and productivity by limiting batch size of deliveries, you will be quicker to identify root causes of issues and resolve them. Once a task is finished, you will check it in your common code repository, validate it with your continuous integration platform and subsequently deploy it in your production. As the batch size is small, identification of production issues due to code deliveries will be easier, potentially required road, potentially required road backs, rollbacks will be less cumbersome. Furthermore, by, by continuously delivering in production, your team will have the constant pride of contributing to your organizational mission. And we will leave this to you to compare this mode of working uh, with morale and motivation and technical challenges of teams who built their codes for eight months, you know, without delivering anything to production and now you know, wondering if they will able work and obviously, you know, if you give your team the buffer to work, but still, you know, enable and motivate them to do quick deployments, you know, in, in short lead times with small batches, then you will only reap the benefits and you will thank, thank, uh, thanks DevOps and probably myself as well <laughs> later. Okay. 
Use 20% of your time to reduce technical debt. This is also very interesting that uh, we should pay attention. So when your organization doesn't reserve time to reduce its technical debt, but continues building workarounds or the top of workarounds, it will come to a point where all engineers spend all of their time to fix issues. Probably this describes your organization as well. In, in financial analogy of debt concept, your work of organization will be only paying, you know, debt <laughs> interest, but they will be never, you know, paying back to actual debt, and therefore you know, this debt will uh, remain there uh, forever. So in conclusion, so in this video, we covered for you what value stream uh, and flow in DevOps are and why they are important and what you can do uh, to basically, uh, you know, remove the road, uh, roadmaps and then enable a continuous workflow in your organization. So as a summary, let me walk through. So basically, you need to define a mission to get started and to be able to, you know, implement this vision, you need to identify your value stream and then you will end up such a, you know, sketch uh, on the top, on your on your table and then you'll basically, you know, find out the, the vests, the inefficiencies on the sketch and then you will basically challenge why, you know, these gray areas are far more or usually far more larger than the white areas. As a reminder, the white area is the time that you spend for the actual work and then the gray area is the, is the time you spend to sort this out and now you'll basically challenge and then identify and then you will basically speed up the process and then next process you eliminate handoffs, constraints and vests as much as, much as is possible and then you basically you need to challenge the duration required for each handoff you need to eliminate the vests caused by the repetitive handoffs and you need to challenge and remove the handoffs as much as is possible you know it's you know removing a handoff is always better than uh, better than basically you know, uh, you know, reducing the time required to you know for a handoff is 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 not the great thing. You know, let's remove it as much as you can, and you make your flow visible for everyone. This is also very important. Here is an example. It's a Kanban board, multi-dimensional Kanban board, one board for design, one board for development, and another board for operation team. And as I mentioned before, you limit the batch size and working progress, and you use you know twenty percent of your team capacity to basically um, reduce your um, technical debt. So having said all of this, we came to the end of this video. I hope you enjoyed this uh, and in the next week, so potentially next week or in the coming days, I'm going to provide you another video. Let me check what the subject of this video will be. Um, the video subject uh, will be how you should design your DevOps continuous delivery and deployment pipeline. So we are, you know, slowly getting, you know, hands off the things. Therefore, the next lesson, you know, how we design DevOps continuous delivery and deployment pipeline will be very interesting for you. And I hope to see you in the next lesson. And for now, have a great day and take care. Bye-bye.